Welcome to Emmanuel Baptist Church and Happy Chinese New Year. 新年快乐，牛年大吉，新年快乐，牛年大吉。We are gathered from many nations, languages, and traditions, but God has brought us together to one people in Christ Jesus. May you be blessed as we worship God today. Since today is part of the Chinese New Year, I would like to read a Chinese verse to my Emmanuel family here. 中文圣经和合本，约翰三书一章二节如此说：亲爱的兄弟啊，我愿你凡事兴盛，身体健壮，正如你的灵魂兴盛一样。中文圣经和合本，约翰三书一章二节如此说：亲爱的兄弟啊，我愿你凡事兴盛。身体健壮，正如你的灵魂兴盛一样。Dear friend, I pray that you are prospering in every way and are in good health, just as your whole life is going well. Third John chapter one verse two, the NIV version. Let us all prepare our hearts for worship as Judy plays the morning prelude. 
Good morning, boys and girls. Today I'm going to tell you another story of a child from Rwanda. We had a friend who was living in Rwanda and he needed a gardener. And so he hired a man to help him in the garden. And this man brought a young boy with him to help him. The boy was about 12 years old. And it was odd because it was a school day and the boy was not in school. So our friend asked him, why are you not in school? And he found out that he had been a street child for the last six years, from the time he was six years old to 12 years old. He asked him if he wanted to go to school and the young boy said yes, that he did. And so our friend said he would pay for the school fees. And he continued to do that. And over the years, this young boy wanted to thank our friend and he painted him a picture. And when he saw the picture, our friend said, you could sell this, this is worth money. And so he started to paint pictures and sell them for money. Now in Kigali, he's a famous artist along with his brother and they've opened up the Neo Arts Center. They've also started now the Neo Foundation for children and women. And recently they've started doing some tourism where they do tours into the Akragera Park and to go see the gorillas. So this is an exciting story because it was a young boy who was on the street and then ended up going to school because he met a man of God. This young man now helps 125 other street kids go to school. Over 300 women and children he helps with training. And now recently, all of those funds that are raised from his artwork, as well as his dancing and drumming and the tours, all go to help his community. I just think it's an amazing story that God had a part in playing to help this boy come off the street and now look how many others he's helping. Let's pray for Pacific as he continues to help the children in Kigali and those in the surrounding areas. And we'll pray for you today too. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for young children like Pacific who grow up to be godly men and help others. We pray that his work will continue in Rwanda and that he will continue to help those in need. Lord, our children also are growing up and we ask you to place in their heart a passion for helping others. We thank you for how you've kept them safe during this pandemic, and we ask you to continue to do that, Lord. Help them grow to be the adults that you want them to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Bye, boys and girls. We'll see you next week. Good morning, Emmanuel. Thank you for joining us in today's service. Today's scripture reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 1 to 5 and 16 to 21. Starting at verse 1. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an internal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead of our heavenly dwelling, 
because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed, instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal shall be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Verse sixteen. So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do not so longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to Himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them, and He has committed to us. The message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making His appeal through us. We implore you on God, Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the reading of God's word. Amen. Good morning and happy Chinese New Year. I'd like to share a story with you this morning from my time in Rwanda, and perhaps I've shared this story already. I, I can't remember, but if you've heard it before, please just bear with me. It was a significant experience for me. You know, aside from the genocide, many people know very little about Rwanda, a tiny landlocked nation in East Africa. The country does boast some world-class attractions for anyone who wishes to holiday there, but once you get outside the tourist areas or the main cities, there really are many places that are hardly ever visited by foreigners. Now, for my work in the country, I used to travel quite extensively into these rural areas. And when I did, it was common for the children to come running, crying out, "Mzungu, Mzungu," loosely translated, "White man, White man." It was a novelty, and uh, a crowd would gather around whenever I entered into the little villages. One time, I was driving with Justin Ubunhu, the director of education for the Rwandan Baptist Church, and as the children came running after us, crying out, "Mzungu, Mzungu." He said to me with a smile, "I wonder what it would be like if I ever came to visit in Canada." And as we talked about it, he was imagining that his experience in Canada would be essentially the same as my experience in Rwanda. Children would see the car and come running over, excitedly shouting out, "Black man, black man!" <laughs> it was an awkward moment for me. First of all, because I knew full well that I was experiencing white privilege in those rural villages, but more importantly, it was awkward for me to know how to respond to his question with honesty and transparency. Because how would he be treated? Well, certainly the children wouldn't coming running out would wouldn't come running out to greet him, crying out "Black man, black man!" But more to the point. As a Black African in Canada, he would most likely experience racism. February is Black History Month in Canada. This is a time when we celebrate Black culture and the achievements of people of African descent. But it's also a time for us all to become better informed about the challenges that still face the Black community concerning the persistence of racism. And systemic inequality that continues to plague our nation. Now, these challenges are not unique to the Black community, but 
This is Black History Month in Canada. And the events of the past 12 months have really brought anti-black racism to the top of the social agenda for many countries around the world, including our own. Now, as we began Black History Month last week, Reverend Charles Lawrence got us off with a great start with his message, Jesus is the answer. And this is the theme which the, the Black History Month committee has set for the month of February. And as I reflected on the theme, Jesus is the answer, I kept thinking to myself, I know that Jesus is the answer, but what is the question? What is the question? I think the question that confronts us every year during Black History Month is simply this. What are the underlying causes of anti-black racism? And how can we put an end to it once and for all? Now, if I were a political scientist, (laughs) I'd have a lot to say about the events of January 6th in the United States, about the Republican Party. But you know what? I'm not a political scientist. If I were a sociologist, I'd have a lot to say about the, the devastating, dehumanizing impact of slavery and its legacy generation after generation. And also the troubling growth of white supremacy among conservatives in many Western nations but I'm not a sociologist. If I were a historian, I'd have a lot to say about the root causes of the treatment of indigenous peoples and particularly how colonialism has led to oppression and systemic racism in many countries of the world. But I'm not a historian. I'm a pastor. And so I approach the question from the perspective of a pastor after studying God's holy word. And so if Jesus is the answer, and I certainly believe this to be true, then what is the question? What is the central issue we're dealing with? Simply stated, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. Back in December, I preached the sermon on Isaiah about social justice and anti-black racism. And in that message, you may recall, I made reference to the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, section 15. We should all know this. Every individual is equal before and under the law and has the right to the equal protection and equal benefit of the law without discrimination. And in particular, without discrimination based on race, national or ethnic origin, color, religion, sex, age, or mental or physical disability. But despite these bedrock values upon which our Canadian society is built regarding human dignity and equality, the sad truth is that collectively, Canadian society continues to fall short of these lofty ideals. I was reading recently from an article about a professor at York University by the name of Lorne Foster, Dr. Lorne Foster. He's the director of the Institute for Social Research at York, and he's recently launched a study called the Blackness in Canada Project. This is an effort to collect data on real-world experiences of black people. He, He said this, the dominant cultural narrative defines Canada as a non-racist or post-racial society, yet disparities continue to exist unabated in education, child services, criminal justice, and the workplace. He goes on to say, not only does systemic racism exist in Canada, it often lies hidden beneath the veneer of normalcy, allowing for discriminatory practices in all sectors of society to continue unchecked for years. This isn't a perception, it's a fact. And Dr. Foster can back up his statement with numerous studies and extensive statistical analysis of the data. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. Clearly we have a long way to go and there's much work yet to be done, but there is an answer to this question and it's written throughout the pages of God's word. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer because only Jesus can change the heart of stone into a heart of flesh. 
Jesus is the answer because only Jesus can confront people about their egocentric, self-interested lives and transform them into outward-looking, loving, and caring people. Jesus is the answer because only Jesus has the power through God's Spirit to take off our blinders and help us to see the world and all those around us in a completely new light. Only God's Spirit can perform the radical heart surgery that's needed to bring real, genuine, lasting change. So if we turn to our scripture text from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, the Apostle Paul writes the following. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Now, let me just start by saying that this passage of Scripture is not primarily about race relationships or even human rights. The passage really is primarily about sharing the good news of the gospel with others. And Paul is speaking in very general terms about uh, saving faith in Jesus Christ in these verses. Nevertheless, I believe that these words have an important message for us as we consider the problem of the human heart. Because Paul is saying it's, it is only when a person is changed by the Lord Jesus that they will experience deep and lasting change in the heart. In verse 16, the Apostle Paul says, we no longer view people from a human point of view. And he means that when we accept God's grace, his gift of salvation, Jesus changes us and we become citizens of heaven. We become, as he says, a new creation. And as newly created beings, a profound change takes place in our heart. Look at verse 16. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. You see, because of this faith in Jesus Christ, Paul says that he no longer makes superficial personal judgments based on external appearances. This is a very significant statement. Paul is saying we no longer live for ourselves. Instead, we live for the one who is crucified and risen for, for us. Therefore, from now on, we are believers and we don't look at anyone according to the flesh. In the life of the Apostle Paul, this was literally a realization that turned his life upside down. One moment he was persecuting the church, the next moment he was the driving force behind the church's expansion and growth and, ex and evangelism in the first century. One moment he is persecuting and arresting believers. The next moment he's being arrested, beaten, and imprisoned for declaring the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. One moment he is zealous for the people of Israel, and the next moment he's arguing passionately for the inclusion of Gentiles as full members in the Christian church. For Paul, his encounter with Jesus Christ led him to a conversion experience that completely transformed him from the inside out. And most notably, it led him to abandon his previous worldly perspectives and judgments and to see every single person in a new light. So let me just draw out three important insights from these verses of Scripture. First of all, the problem of the human heart can only be remedied through the intervention of saving faith through Jesus Christ. As long as human beings rely on their own common sense or their own ability to reason or personal ideas about others and the world around them, we will continue to see people judge one another based on worldly points of view. And inevitably, this will lead to division and attitudes and behaviors that cause dissension and differences between people. Only Christ can change the human heart. Only God's Spirit can make us new. 
Moreover, the central message of this passage in 2 Corinthians is that we are now ambassadors of reconciliation. And Paul's primary point is that the sharing of the good news of the gospel is our solemn obligation as Christ followers because we know that Christ alone is the hope of nations, not legislation or vaccinations or therapy or scientific discoveries or education, as important as all these things are. Only Christ can redeem and transform our hearts of stone and turn them into hearts of flesh. And we are his ambassadors to bring reconciliation to God and to one another. And the second point is that anyone who is in Christ sees the world from an entirely different perspective, as we've seen in the dramatic conversion of the Apostle Paul. Being under the lordship of Christ means being under his authority, under his rule, being subject to his values and perspectives and priorities, just as we considered two Sundays ago. Do you remember Christ's love? compels us to think about others, how our actions impact them. And we are called to limit our behavior in order to show care and compassion for our brothers and sisters in Christ. In Romans chapter 14, the Apostle Paul writes, if your brother or sister is distressed because what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not let your eating destroy someone else for whom Christ died. We are responsible for one another. We have to always hold up the other person so that we show the care and compassionate love of Christ in all that we do. True Christian love fosters a deep sense of empathy for those around us, and it requires us to examine our attitudes and actions in order to demonstrate care and concern for others. This means we must fundamentally be concerned for the well-being of our neighbors. And so we can say with certainty that racism has no place in the heart of a follower of Jesus Christ or in the church. Racist attitudes and behaviors are fundamentally worldly focused and unspiritual. They are in opposition to the message of the gospel, and to the spirit of Christ. And the third thing that we learn from this passage is that we are all called to love people. Our concern should not be focused on the things that divide us, but rather on those things that bind us together in unity. Particularly for the believer, it is the spirit of God that is the unifying force in our fellowship. For all of those who are already a part of God's kingdom, who've already received Jesus Christ through faith, and who have already experienced God's new creation, we are one. We are fellow sojourners along life's journey. We share concern for each other. We weep with those who weep, and we rejoice with those who rejoice. This is not an optional add-on for faith. This is central to the Christian life, as, as much as baptism or communion. It is to ask God every day to shape our heart so that it beats with the heartbeat of Christ until we are able to love as he loved, until we are able to demonstrate in word and action care and concern for others as Jesus did. Until this work in us is complete, we must continue to carefully examine ourselves and root out any vestiges of human worldly judgments of others. And we live out the call to be ambassadors of reconciliation. First of all, to invite people to be reconciled to God, and secondly, to reconcile all people to one another in respectful, caring relationships. Oh, yes, Jesus is the answer. So in closing, I'd like to offer a a hopeful word. First, from Dr. Lauren Foster of York University, who I referenced earlier. In response to the convergence of his research program, the International Decade for People of uh, African Descent, and 
the widespread marches throughout the world in solidarity against anti-black racism, he wrote this. It's not a slam dunk that this convergence is actually going to take us where we would like to go, but I think that it has given us an excellent opportunity to move the needle toward a more equitable and democratic society in Canada. I'm hopeful that we can do that. And I share Dr. Foster's hopes as well. And I hope you do too. And secondly, I'd like to share a few excerpts from Amanda Gorman's presidential inauguration poem. Did you, poem. Did you hear it? Although it is thoroughly rooted in the U.S. context, it also expresses so many aims and ambitions that we all share. We are striving to forge a union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of men. And so we lift our gazes not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first, we must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so that we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. If we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in the bridges we've made. That is the promised glade, the hill we climb, if only we dare. It's because being an American is more than a pride we inherit. It's a past we step into and how we repair it. The new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it. If only we're brave enough to be it. This is our prayer, Lord. May we be that light. May we be your ambassadors for your kingdom on earth, for your glory. Amen. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain, firm beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me. When I am surrounded, your love carries me. Surprising, I can feel it rising. All the joy that's growing deep inside of me. Every time I see you, all your goodness shines through. I can feel this God song rising up in me.
Good morning everyone. My name is Rohan Stewart and it is that time of our worship service when we come together in prayer. Our Savior Jesus Christ taught us to pray like this. Our Father in heaven, you are holy and we adore you. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today a clean heart, a clean mind. Let us put aside our old selves and let us be renewed through Jesus Christ our Savior. As you restore us unto you, bind us together and draw us closer to you. Search us, O God. Know our hearts and see if there is any wicked way in us and lead us in the way of everlasting peace. We are your people. We are your church. And we are Christ's ambassadors. Continue to use us to gather your nations together and give us the strength to stay firm in your promises. I know, Father in heaven, that you are ready to forgive and to pour your abundant mercies onto all of us as long as we call on your name of Jesus, your Son and Savior. I pray for your Holy Spirit to continue to work in our pastor, church staff, council members, our elders, and all your worshipers. I pray your people listening or watching today's sermon has been reminded they are ambassadors of our mighty God. I pray also for those who have not accepted Jesus as their Savior, that they will call upon you and surrender their hearts and minds to you. Let us all confess our sins so we can be cleansed from all unrighteousness. I pray for all comfort and peace in this time of mandatory isolation, lockdowns worldwide to prevent the spread of COVID-19. For those mourning the loss of a loved one or whatever known or unknown matter that may trouble their minds. Also for our politicians to work together with integrity and not for what is popular. Restore us the joy of your salvation as ambassadors of heaven, Heavenly Father. Continue to pour your holy and mighty spirit in this world. Do not forsake us, Heavenly Father. Let your will be done in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Morning, Emmanuel. This is the time in our service where we take up our offering. There are several ways that you can still be sending in your offerings to the church. One is dropping off your envelopes in the mail slot at the church building. The other way is to request to have someone come by and pick it up from your house or wherever you're living. Also, you can be giving online. Uh, you can get more information on how to do this by contacting the office or checking out our website. 2 Corinthians 9 verses 6 through 8 says this about giving. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Join me as I pray for our offerings. God, thank you so much that you give generously to us. Thank you for providing all of our needs. We pray that as we give our offerings to you, that you would continue to bless our church family and the ministries that we do. 
We pray that it would be a blessing to our neighborhood and to the world as we serve you in so many different ways. We pray that you would um, provide for all of our needs and be with us as we continue to um, come together as a community and support one another in so many different ways. We pray that you bless our ministries through our offerings and that you continue to bless our church, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Bye! At the beginning of the service, I brought New Year's greetings in Mandarin and Cantonese. The worship planning team wanted to acknowledge that there are many other cultures that also celebrate the Lunar New Year. So please receive this joyful expression of Happy New Year as our way of blessing you in hopes of good health, joy, and prosperity for this new year. 新年快乐, Xin chào mọi người, chúc mọi người năm mới vui vẻ, an khang thịnh vượng, vạn sự như ý, phát tài phát lộc và bình an hạnh phúc. Happy Lunar New Year everyone! Thank you for worshiping with us today. We're so glad that you're able to join with us. And wherever you are in the world, we wish you well and hope that you're staying safe and uh, looking after yourself and those that you love. Now for our opportunities, uh, tomorrow, Monday, uh, the Family Day Monday at 6.30, we will be having a Family Day virtual concert. This is sponsored by the Black History Month Committee, and uh, it will feature music by the Watoto Choir, uh, a, t a piece in entitled We Will Go, and then it will also have the Jerusalem Dance Challenge. And I hope that you're um, looking forward to that. We are. Uh, you can tune in at 6.30 Monday night uh, through Facebook or YouTube, just the same as our worship services on Sunday morning. The season of Lent begins this Wednesday, and there are some of us who use the YouVersion Bible or it's also available online at uh, uh, thebible.com. 
and uh, they have various different um, reading plans that you can do for your daily devotions. And for the season of Lent, I'm suggesting that we use the reading plan called Lent Journey. It's actually from 2016, but it's for the season of Lent, and I think it will work nicely. So if you wanted to join me, we're, we'll be starting this Wednesday as we begin the season of Lent. The annual reports are being prepared and will be available for distribution this Wednesday. And so uh, the annual reports will have uh, all of the summary of the things that have happened in the life of our church in 2020. It should be an interesting read this year. Looking forward to that. Then we'll be having our annual meeting on the 28th of February from 1 to 3 in the afternoon. It will be a virtual meeting. And in this case, because of the technical difficulties of having a vote on Zoom, we are limiting attendance to those people who are active members in the church. Now, this week we will be sending out the annual reports and all of the other documents, the follow-up documents from the town hall and additional information uh, in order to respond to the questions that were raised at the town hall meeting. Um, these will be, first of all, sent in the mail to any member who uh, does not have an email address. It will be physically sent through the mail. Anybody who does have an email address, for active members, you'll receive all the documentation and the annual report in PDF form. And for anyone else who is an active participant in the life of the church, but not a member, you will also receive an email that will contain the town hall documents and that background information. Now, for anybody who receives the annual reports in a PDF format, or for anyone else who is interested in the annual reports and doesn't receive the PDF, uh, print copies will be available here at the church. And uh, you can come and pick that up starting Wednesday of this week. However, we need you to contact the office 24 hours in advance, that is Tuesday, February the 16th, to let us know that you're planning to come and pick up a print copy because we're not going to print paper copies for everyone. For many people, the PDF electronic version will be sufficient. But if you request a paper copy, we're happy to provide one for you. And these can be picked up anytime from Wednesday, Wednesday, February the 17th, between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m., or Sunday, February the 21st, between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. So, um, so again, we'll be sending out PDF copies, and uh, if that's sufficient for you, that's great. If you want a paper copy, you can request it by Tuesday and then come and stop by the office this week and pick up your copy. And now for the benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen.